A True Story by Lucian of Samosata, translated by Austin Morris Harmon. Book 2. From that time on, as I could no longer endure the life in the whale and was discontented with the loneliness, I sought a way of escape. First we determined to dig through the right side and make off. And we made a beginning and fell to cutting in. But when we had advanced some five furlongs without getting anywhere, we left off digging and decided to set the forest afire, thinking that in this way the whale could be killed, and in that case our escape would be easy. So we began at the tail end and set it afire. For seven days and seven nights he was unaffected by the burning, but on the eighth and ninth we gathered that he was in a bad way. For instance, he yawned less frequently, and whenever he did yawn, he closed his mouth quickly. On the tenth and eleventh day, mortification at last set in and he was noisome. On the twelfth, we perceived just in time that if someone did not shore his jaws open when he yawned, so that he could not close them again. We stood a chance of being shut up in the dead whale and dying there ourselves. At the last moment, then, we propped the mouth open with great beams and made our boat ready, putting aboard all the water we could and the other provisions. Our sailing master was to be Cinthorus. On the next day, the whale was dead at last. We dragged the boat up, took her through the gaps, made her fast to the teeth and lowered her slowly into the sea. Climbing on the back and sacrificing to Poseidon there by the trophy, we camped for three days, as it was calm. On the fourth day we sailed off, and in so doing met and grounded on many of the dead from the sea fight, and measured their bodies with amazement. For some days, we sailed with a moderate breeze, and then a strong norther blew up and brought on great cold. The entire sea was frozen by it. Not just on the surface, but to a depth of fully six fathoms, so that we could leave the boat and run on the ice. The wind held and we could not stand it, so we devised an odd remedy, the proposer of the idea was Cinthorus. We dug a very large cave in the water and stopped in it for thirty days. Keeping a fire burning and eating the phyasage that we found in digging. When our provisions at last failed, we came out, hauled up the boat, which had frozen in, spread our canvas and slid, gliding on the ice smoothly and easily, just as if we were sailing. On the fifth day, it was warm again. The ice broke up and everything turned to water once more. After sailing about three hundred furlongs, we ran in at a small desert island, where we got water, which had failed by this time, and shot two wild bulls, and then sailed away. These bulls did not have their horns on their head but under their eyes, as Momus wanted. Not long afterwards, we entered a sea of milk, not of water, and in it a white island, full of grapevines, came in sight. The island was a great solid cheese, as we afterwards learned by tasting it. It was twenty-five furlongs in circumference. The vines were full of grapes, but the liquid which we squeezed from them and drank was milk instead of wine. A temple had been constructed in the middle of the island in honor of Galatea the Nereid, as its inscription indicated. All the time that we stopped in the island the earth was our bread and meat and the milk from the grapes our drink. The ruler of that region was said to be Tyro, daughter of Salmonius, who after departure from home received this guerdon from Poseidon. After stopping five days on the island, we started out on the sixth, with a bit of breeze, propelling us over a rippling sea. On the eighth day, by which time we were no longer sailing through the milk, but in briny blue water, we came in sight of many men running over the sea, like us in every way, both in shape and in size except only their feet, which were of cork, that is why they were called cork feet, if I am not mistaken. We were amazed to see that they did not go under, but stayed on the top of the waves, and went about fearlessly. Some of them came up and greeted us in the Greek language. They said that they were on their way to Cork, their native city. For some distance, they traveled with us, running alongside, and then they turned off and went their way, wishing us luck on our voyage. In a little while many islands came in sight. Near us, to port, was Cork. Where the men were going, a city built on a great round cork. At a distance and more to starboard were five islands, very large and high, from which much fire was blazing up. Dead ahead was one that was flat and low-lying, not less than five hundred furlongs off. 
when at length we were near it, a wonderful breeze blew about us, sweet and fragrant, like the one that, on the word of the historian Herodotus, breathes perfume from Araby the blessed. The sweetness that met us was as if it came from roses, and narcissi, and hyacinths, and lilies, and violets, from myrrh, and laurel, and vines in bloom. Delighted with the fragrance and cherishing high hopes after our long toils, we gradually drew near to the island at last. Then we saw many harbors all about it, large and unfretted by beating waves, transparent rivers emptying softly into the sea. Meads, too, and woods and songbirds, some of them singing on the shore and many in the branches. A rare, pure atmosphere enfolded the place, and sweet breezes with their blowing stirred the woods gently, so that from the moving branches came a whisper of delightful, unbroken music. Like the fluting of pandine pipes in desert places. Moreover, a confused sound could be heard incessantly, which was not noisy, but resembled that made at a drinking party, when some are playing, others singing and others beating time, to the flute or the lyre. Enchanted with all this, we put in. Anchored our boat and landed, leaving Cynthorus and two of my comrades on board. Advancing through a flowery mead, we came upon the guards and sentinels, who bound us with rosy wreaths, the strongest fetter that they have and led us inland to their ruler. They told us on the way that the island was the one that is called the Isle of the Blessed, and that the ruler was the Cretan Radamanthus. On being brought before him, we were given fourth place among the people awaiting trial. The first case was that of Ajax son of Telamon. To decide whether he should be allowed to associate with the heroes or not, he was accused of having gone mad and killed himself. At last, when much had been said, Radamanthus gave judgment that, for the present, after taking a dose of hellebore, he should be given in charge of Hippocrates. The comb physician, and that later on, when he had recovered his wits, he should have a place at the table of the heroes. The second case was a love affair, Theseus and Menelaus at law over Helen, to determine which of the two she should live with. Radamanthus pronounced that she should live with Menelaus, because he had undergone so much toil and danger on account of his marriage, then, too, Theseus had other wives, the Amazon and the daughters of Minos. The third judgment was given in a matter of precedence between Alexander, son of Philip, and Hannibal of Carthage, and the decision was that Alexander outranked Hannibal, so his chair was placed next the elder Cyrus of Persia. We were brought up forth, and he asked us how it was that we trod on holy ground while still alive, and we told him the whole story. Then, he had us removed, pondered for a long time, and consulted with his associates about us. Among many other associates, he had Aristides the Just, of Athens. When he had come to a conclusion, sentence was given that for being inquisitive and not staying at home we should be tried after death but that for the present we might stop a definite time in the island and share the life of the heroes, and then we must be off. They set the length of our stay at not more than seven months. Thereupon our garlands fell away of themselves, and we were set free and taken into the city and to the table of the blessed. The city itself is all of gold and the wall around it of emerald. It has seven gates, all of single planks of cinnamon. The foundations of the city and the ground within its walls are ivory. There are temples of all the gods, built of beryl, and in them great monolithic altars of amethyst, on which they make their great burnt offerings. Around the city runs a river of the finest myrrh. A hundred royal cubits wide and five deep, so that one can swim in it comfortably. For baths they have large houses of glass, warmed by burning cinnamon, instead of water there is hot dew in the tubs. For clothing they use delicate purple spiderwebs. As for themselves, they have no bodies. But are intangible and fleshless, with only shape and figure. Incorporeal as they are, they nevertheless live and move and think and talk. In a word, it would appear that their naked souls go about in the semblance of their bodies. Really, if one did not touch them. He could not tell that what he saw was not a body for they are like upright shadows, only not black. Nobody grows old, but stays the same age as on coming there. Again, it is neither night among them nor yet very bright day. But the light which is on the country is like the grey morning toward dawn, when the sun has not yet risen.
Moreover, they are acquainted with only one season of the year, for it is always spring there and the only wind that blows there is zephyr. The country abounds in flowers and plants of all kinds, cultivated and otherwise. The grapevines yield twelve vintages a year, bearing every month, the pomegranates, apples and other fruit trees were said to bear thirteen times a year, for in one month, their minoan, they bear twice. Instead of wheat ears, loaves of bread all baked grow on the tops of the homes, so that they look like mushrooms. In the neighborhood of the city there are 365 springs of water, as many of honey, 500 of myrrh, much smaller. However, seven rivers of milk and eight of wine. Their table is spread outside the city in the Elysian fields, a very beautiful mead with thick woods of all sorts round about it, overshadowing the feasters. The couches they lie on are made of flowers, and they are attended and served by the winds, who, however, do not pour out their wine, for they do not need anyone to do this. There are great trees of the clearest glass around the table, and instead of fruit they bear cups of all shapes and sizes. When anyone comes to table, he picks one or two of the cups and puts them at his place. These fill with wine at once, and that is the way they get their drink. Instead of garlands, the nightingales and the other songbirds gather flowers in their bills from the fields hard by and drop them down like snow, flying overhead and singing. Furthermore, the way they are scented is that thick clouds draw up myrrh from the springs and the river, stand over the table and under the gentle manipulation of the winds rain down a delicate dew. At the board they pass their time with poetry and song. For the most part they sing the epics of Homer, who is there himself and shares the revelry, lying at table in the place above Odysseus. Their choruses are of boys and girls, led and accompanied by Unimus of Locris, Arion of Lesbos, Anacreon and Stasichorus. There can be no doubt about the latter, for I saw him there, by that time Helen had forgiven him. When they stop singing another chorus appears, composed of swans and swallows and nightingales, and as they sing the whole wood renders the accompaniment, with the winds leading. But the greatest thing that they have for ensuring a good time is that two springs are by the table, one of laughter and the other of enjoyment. They all drink from each of these when the revels begin, and thenceforth enjoy themselves and laugh all the while. But I desire to mention the famous men whom I saw there. There were all the demigods and the veterans of Troy except Locrian Ajax, the only one, they said, who was being punished in the place of the wicked. Of the barbarians there were both Cyruses, the Scythian Anacarsis, the Thracians Amalxis and Numa, the Italian. In addition, there were Lycurgus of Sparta, Phocian and Talus of Athens, and the wise men, all but Periander. I also saw Socrates, the son of Sophroniscus, chopping logic with Nestor and Polymedes, about him were Hyacinthus of Sparta, Narcissus of Thespi, Hylas and other handsome lads. It seemed to me that Hyacinthus was his especial favorite, for at any rate he refuted him most. It was said that Rhadamanthus was angry at Socrates and had often threatened to Bonius H. him from the island if he kept up his nonsense and would not quit his irony and be merry. Plato alone was not there, it was said that he was living in his imaginary city under the constitution and the laws that he himself wrote. The followers of Aristippus and Epicurus were in the highest favor among the heroes, because they are pleasant and agreeable and jolly good fellows. Aesop the Phrygian was also there, they have him for a jester. Diogenes the cynic had so changed his ways that he not only married Lays, the courtesan, but often got up and danced and indulged in tomfoolery when he had had too much. None of the Stoics was there, they were said to be still on the way up the steep hill of virtue. With regard to Chrysippus, we heard tell that he is not permitted to set foot on the island until he submits himself to the hellebore treatment for the fourth time. They said that the academicians wanted to come but were still holding off and debating, for they could not arrive at a conclusion even on the question whether such an island existed. Then too, I suppose they feared to have Rhadamanthus judge them. As they themselves had abolished standards of judgment. It was said, however, that many of them had started to follow people coming thither, but fell behind through their slowness, being constitutionally unable to arrive at anything, and so turned back halfway. 
these were the most conspicuous of those present. They render a special honors to Achilles and after him to Theseus. About lovemaking their attitude is such that they bill and coo openly, in plain sight of everyone, without any discrimination, and think no shame of it at all. Socrates The only exception used to protest that he was above suspicion in his relations with young persons, but everyone held him guilty of perjury. In fact, Hyacinthus and Narcissus often said that they knew better, but he persisted in his denial. They all have their wives in common and nobody is jealous of his neighbor, in this point they out Plato Plato. Complaisance is the universal rule. Hardly two or three days had passed before I went up to Homer the poet when we were both at leisure and questioned him about everything. Above all, said I, where do you come from? This point in particular is being investigated even yet at home. I am not unaware, said he, that some think me a Chian, some a Smyrniot and many a Colophonian. As a matter of fact, I am a Babylonian. And among my fellow countrymen my name was not Homer, but Tigranes. Later on, when I was a hostage, Homeros, among the Greeks, I changed my name. I went on to inquire whether the bracketed lines had been written by him, and he asserted that they were all his own, consequently. I held the grammarian Sinodotus and Aristarchus guilty of pedantry in the highest degree. Since he had answered satisfactorily on these points, I next asked him why he began with the wrath of Achilles, and he said that it just came into his head that way, without any study. Moreover, I wanted to know whether he wrote the Odyssey before the Iliad, as most people say, he said no. That he was not blind, as they say, I understood at once, I saw it, and so had no need to ask. Often again at other times I would do this when I saw him at leisure. I would go and make inquiries of him and he would give me a cordial answer to everything, particularly after the lawsuit that he won for a charge of libel had been brought against him by Thersites because of the way he had ridiculed him in the poem, and the case was won by Homer, with Odysseus for his lawyer. At about this time arrived Pythagoras of Samos who had undergone seven transformations, had lived in seven bodies, and had now ended the migrations of his soul. All his right side was of gold. Judgment was pronounced that he should become a member of their community, but when I left the point was still at issue whether he ought to be called Pythagoras or Euphorbus. Empedocles came too, all burned and his body completely cooked, but he was not received in spite of his many entreaties. As time went on their games came round, the games of the dead. The referees were Achilles, serving for the fifth time, and Theseus for the seventh. The full details would make a long story, but I shall tell the principal things that they did. In wrestling the winner was Carinus, the descendant of Heracles, who defeated Odysseus for the championship. The boxing was a draw between Arius the Egyptian, who was buried at Corinth, and Epius. For combined boxing and wrestling, they offer no prizes. In the foot race I do not remember who won and in poetry. Homer was really far the best man, but Hesiod won. The prize in each case was a crown that was plated of peacock feathers. Hardly had the games been concluded when word came that those who were under punishment in the place of the wicked had burst their bonds, had overpowered their guard, and were advancing on the island, that they were under the leadership of Phalaris of Acragas, Busiris the Egyptian, Diamond of Thrace, and Siron and Pityocamps. When Radamanthus heard of this, he mustered the heroes on the shore. They were led by Theseus, Achilles, and Ajax, the son of Telamon, who by this time had recovered his wits. They engaged and fought, and the heroes won. Achilles contributed most to their success, but Socrates, who was stationed on the right wing, was brave, too, far more so than when he fought at Delium in his lifetime. When four of the enemy came at him, he did not run away, but kept his face to the front. For this, they afterwards gave him a special reward, a beautiful great park in the suburbs, where he used to gather his comrades and dispute, he named the place the Academy of the Dead. Arresting the losers and putting them in irons, they sent them off, to be punished, still more severely than before. An account of this battle was written by Homer, and as I was leaving, he gave me the book to take to the people at home.
but later I lost it along with everything else. The poem began. This time, sing me, O oh muse, of the shades of the heroes in battle. But to return, they cooked beans, as is their custom when they are successful at war, had a feast in honor of the victory and made a great holiday. Pythagoras was the only one who did not take part in it, he sat by himself and went dinnerless because he detested beans. Six months had passed and it was about the middle of the seventh when sedition arose. Cinerus, the son of Cynthorus, a tall and handsome lad, had long been in love with Helen, and it was no secret that she herself was madly enamored of the boy. For instance, they often winked to one another at table, drank to each other and got up together and wandered about the wood. Well, one fine day, through love and despair Cinerus determined to rape Helen, she agreed to it, and go to one of the islands in the offing, either cork or cheesy. As accomplices, they had long ago taken on three of the most reckless of my comrades, but Cinerus did not inforum his father. For he knew that he would not let him do it. When they had come to a decision, they carried out their stratagem. It was at nightfall, and I was not on hand, as I chanced to be taking a nap under the table. Without the knowledge of the rest, they carried Helen off and put to sea in haste. About midnight, when Menelaus woke up, and found that his wife was not in bed, he made a great stir and took his brother and went to King Radamanthus. But as day began to break the lookout said that they saw the ship far out at sea. Then Radamanthus put fifty of the heroes aboard a ship made of a single log of asphodel and ordered them to give chase. Rolling with a will, they overtook them about noon, just as they were entering the milky place in the ocean near Cheesy, that is all they lacked of escaping. Securing the ship with a hawser of roses, they sailed home. Helen cried and hid her head for shame. As to Cinerus and the rest, first Radamanthus asked them if they had any other accomplices, and they said no. Then he had them secured by the offending member and sent them away to the place of the wicked, after they had been first scourged with mallow. The heroes voted, too, that we be dismissed from the island before our time was up, remaining only till the next day. Thereupon I began to cry aloud and weep, because I had to leave such blessings behind me and resume my wanderings. But they cheered me up, saying that before many years I should come back to them again, and they even pointed out to me my future chair and couch, close to the best people. I went to Radamanthus and earnestly besought him to tell me what would happen and indicate my course. He said that I should reach my native land in spite of many wanderings and dangers, but refused to tell the time of my return. However, pointing out the islands nearby, there were five in sight and a sixth in the distance, these, said he, are the Isles of the Wicked, here close at hand, from which you see all the smoke arising, the sixth yonder is the city of dreams. Next comes the island of Calypso. But you cannot see it yet. When you have sailed by these, you will finally come to the great continent opposite the one which your people inhabit. Then at last, after you have had many adventures and have traveled through all sorts of countries and lived among unfriendly men, in course of time you will reach the other continent. With these words he plucked a root of mallow from the ground and handed it to me, telling me to pray to it in my greatest straits. And he advised me if ever I reached this country, neither to stir the fire with a sword blade nor to eat lupins nor to make love to anyone over eighteen, saying that if I bore these points in mind, I might have good hopes of getting back to the island. Well, I made preparations for the voyage, and when the time came, joined them at the feast. On the next day I went to the poet Homer and begged him to compose me a couplet to carve up, and when he had done so, I set up a slab of barrel near the harbor and had the couplet carved on it. It was one Lucian, whom the blessed gods befriend, beheld what's here, and home again did wend. I stayed that day, too, and put to sea on the next, escorted by the heroes. At that juncture Odysseus came to me without the knowledge of Penelope and gave me a letter to carry to Ogygia Island, to Calypso. Radamanthus sent the pilot Nauplius with me. So that if we touched at the islands, no one might arrest us, thinking we were putting in on another errand. Forging ahead, we had passed out of the fragrant atmosphere when of a sudden a terrible odor greeted us as of asphalt, sulfur, 
and pitch burning together, and a vile, insufferable stench as of roasting human flesh, the atmosphere was murky and foggy, and a pitchy dew distilled from it. Likewise, we heard the noise of scourges and the wailing of many men. The other islands we did not touch at. But the one on which we landed was precipitous and sheer on all sides, it was roughened with rocks and stony places, and there was neither tree nor water in it. We crawled up the cliffs, however, and went ahead in a path full of thorns and calthrops, finding the country very ugly. On coming to the enclosure and the place of punishment, first of all we wondered at the nature of the region. The ground itself was all sown with sword blades and calthrops, and around it flowed three rivers, one of mud, the second of blood and the inmost one of fire. The latter was very large and impossible to cross, it ran like water and undulated like the sea, and it contained many fish, some similar to torches, and some, a smaller variety, to live coals. They called them candlefish. There was a single narrow way leading in, past all the rivers. And the water set there was Timon of Athens. We got through, however, and with Nauplius for our conductor, we saw many kings undergoing punishment, and many commoners, too. Some of them we even recognized, and we saw Cinerus tricked up as a foreset in the smoke of a slow fire. The guides told the life of each, and the crimes for which they were being punished and the severest punishment of all fell to those who told lies while in life and those who had written what was not true, among whom were Tejas of Nidus, Herodotus, and many more. On seeing them, I had good hopes for the future, for I have never told a lie that I know of. Well, I turned back to the ship quickly, for I could not endure the sight, said goodbye to Nauplius, and sailed away. After a short time, the Isle of Dreams came in sight close by, faint and uncertain to the eye. It had itself some likeness to a dream, for as we approached it receded and retired and retreated to a greater distance. Overtaking it at length and sailing into the harbor, called Sleep. We landed near the ivory gates, where the sanctuary of the cock is, about dusk, and on entering the city, we saw many dreams of all sorts. But first I desire to speak of the city itself, since no one else has written about it, and Homer, the only one to mention it at all, was not quite accurate in what he said. On all sides of it is a wood, in which the trees are tall poppies and mandragoras, and they have a great number of bats in them, for there is no other winged thing in the island. A river flows near which they call Sleepwalker. And there are two springs, by the gates, named Soundly and Eight Hours. The wall of the city is high and party-colored, very like a rainbow in tint. The gates in it are not two, as Homer says, but four. Two-faced slowcoach plain, one of which is of iron and the other of earthenware. Through these, it is said, the fearful, murderous, revolting dreams go out. The other two face the harbor and the sea, one of which is of horn and the other, through which we came in, of ivory. As one enters the city, on the right is the Temple of Night. For the gods they worship most are Night and the Cock, whose sanctuary is built near the harbor. On the left is the Palace of Sleep, who rules among them and has appointed two satraps or lieutenants, Nightmare, son of Cosless, and Rich, son of Fancy. In the center of the square is a spring which they call Drausimir, and close to it are two temples, that of Falsehood and that of Truth. There too is their Holy of Holies and their Oracle, which Antiphon, the interpreter of dreams, presided over as prophet, having had this office from sleep. As to the dreams themselves, they differ from one another both in nature and in looks. Some were tall, handsome and well-proportioned, while others were small and ugly, and some were rich, I thought, while others were humble and beggarly. There were winged and portentous dreams among them. And there were others dressed up as if for a carnival, being clothed to represent kings and gods and different characters of the sort. We actually recognized many of them, whom we had seen long ago at home. These came up to us and greeted us like old acquaintances, took us with them, put us to sleep and entertained us very splendidly and hospitably. They treated us like lords in every way, and even promised to make us kings and nabobs. A few of them actually took us off home, gave us a sight of our friends and families, and brought us back the same day. 
For thirty days and thirty nights we stopped with them and fared finely, in our sleep. Then of a sudden a great thunderclap came, we woke up, sprang out of bed and put to sea as soon as we had laid in supplies. On the third day out from there we touched at the island of Ojigia and landed. But first I opened the letter and read what was in it. It was. Odysseus to Calypso, greeting. Soon after I built the raft and sailed away from you I was shipwrecked. And with the help of Leucothea managed to reach the land of the Phaeacians in safety. They sent me home, and there I found that my wife had a number of suitors who were living on the fat of the land at our house. I killed them all, and was afterwards slain by Telegonus, my son by Circe. Now I am on the Isle of the Blessed, thoroughly sorry to have given up my life with you and the immortality which you offered me. Therefore, if I get a chance, I shall run away and come to you. In addition to this, the letter said that she was to entertain us. On going a short way from the sea I found the cave, which was as Homer described it, and found Calypso herself working wool. When she had taken the letter and read it, she wept a long time at first, and then she asked us in to enjoy her hospitality. Gave us a splendid feast and inquired about Odysseus and Penelope, how she looked and whether she was prudent, as Odysseus used to boast in old times. We made her such answers as we thought would please her. After that, we went back to the ship and slept beside it on the shore. And early in the morning we put to sea in a rising wind. We were storm-tossed for two days, and on the third we fell in with the pumpkin pirates. They are savages from the neighboring islands who prey on passing sailors. They have large boats of pumpkin, sixty cubits long. For after drying a pumpkin they hollow it out, take out the insides and go sailing in it, using reeds for masts and a pumpkin leaf for a sail. They attacked us with two crews and gave us battle wounding many of us by hitting us with pumpkin seeds instead of stones. After fighting for a long time on even terms, about noon we saw the nut sailors coming up astern of the pumpkin pirates. They were enemies to one another, as they showed by their actions, for when the pumpkin pirates noticed them coming up, they neglected us and faced about and fought with them. But in the meantime we hoisted our canvas and fled, leaving them fighting. It was evident that the nut sailors would win, as they were in greater numbers, they had five crews, and fought from stouter ships. Their boats were the house of empty nutshells, each of which measured fifteen fathoms in length. When we had lost them from sight, we attended to the wounded, and thereafter we kept under arms most of the time, always looking for attacks. And we did not look in vain. In fact, the sun had not yet gone down when from a desert island there came out against us about twenty men riding on huge dolphins, who were pirates like the others. The dolphins carried them securely and plunged and made like horses. When they were close by, they separated and threw at us from both sides with dry cuttlefly shn crab's eyes. But when we let fly at them with spears and arrows, they could not hold their ground but fled to the island, most of them wounded. About midnight, while it was calm, we unexpectedly ran aground on an enormous kingfisher's nest, really, it was sixty furlongs in circumference. The female was sailing on it, keeping her eggs warm, and she was not much smaller than the nest, in fact, as she started up, she almost sunk the ship with the wind of her wings. She flew off, however, uttering a plaintive cry. We landed when day began to break and observed that the nest was like a great raft, built of huge trees. There were five hundred eggs in it, every one of them bigger than a Chian wine jar. And the chicks were already visible inside them and were chirping. We cut open one of the eggs with axes and took from the shell a featherless chick fatter than twenty vultures. When we had sailed a distance of two hundred furlongs from the nest, great and wonderful signs manifested themselves to us. The gooseneck suddenly grew feathers and started cackling, the sailing master, Cynthorus, who was already bald, became the owner of long hair, and what was strangest of all, the ship's mast budded, branched, and bore fruit at the summit. The fruit consisted of figs and black raisin grapes, which were not yet ripe. On seeing this, we were disturbed, as well we might be, and offered a prayer to the gods on account of the strangeness of the manifestation. 
We had not yet gone five hundred furlongs when we saw a very large, thick forest of pines and cypresses. We thought it was land, but in reality, it was a bottomless sea overgrown with rootless trees, in spite of which the trees stood up motionless and straight, as if they were floating. On drawing near and forming an idea of the situation, we were in a quandary what to do, for it was not possible to sail between the trees, they being thick and close together, nor did it seem easy to turn back. Climbing the tallest tree, I looked to see how things were on the other side. And I saw that the forest extended for fifty stades or a little more, and that another ocean lay beyond. So we resolved to lift the ship on to the treetops, which were thick, and cross over, if we could, to the farther side, and that is what we did. We made her fast to a large rope, climbed the trees and pulled her up with much ado. Setting her on the branches and spreading our canvas, we sailed just as if we were at sea, carried along by the force of the wind. At that juncture a line of the poet Antimachus came into my head, he says somewhere or other. And unto them their forest crews pursuing. We managed the wood in spite of everything and reached the water. Lowering the ship again in the same way we sailed through pure, clear water, until we came to a great crevasse made by the water dividing. Like the cracks that one often sees in the earth, made by earthquakes. Though we got in the sails, the ship was slow to lose headway and so came near being engulfed. Peering over the edge, we saw a precipice of fully a thousand furlongs. Most frightful and unnatural, the water stood there as if cut apart. But as we looked about us we saw on the right at no great distance a bridge thrown across, which was of water, joining the surfaces of the two seas and flowing from one to the other. Rowing up, therefore. We ran into the stream and by great effort got across, though we thought we should never do it. Then we came to a smooth sea and an island of no great size that was easily accessible and was inhabited. It was peopled by savages, the bullheads who have horns in the style that the minotaur is represented at home. Landing, we went up country to get water and food if we could, for we no longer had any. Water we found close by, but there was nothing else to be seen, though we heard a great bellowing not far off. Thinking it was a herd of cattle, we went ahead cautiously and came upon the men of whom I spoke. On seeing us, they gave chase and captured three of my comrades but the rest of us made our escape to the sea. Then, however, we all armed ourselves, it did not seem right to let our friends go unavenged, and fell on the bullheads while they were portioning out the FLESH of the men they had slain. We put them all to flight and gave chase, killing about fifty and taking two alive, then we turned back to the ship with our prisoners. We found no food, though. The rest therefore urged that the captives be killed, I did not approve of this, however, but put them in irons and kept them under guard until ambassadors came from the bullheads, asking for them and offering a ransom. We understood them because they made signs and bellowed plaintively as if in entreaty. The ransom was a number of cheeses, dried fish, onions, and four does, each of which had only three feet, for while they had two behind, the four feet had grown together. In exchange for all this, we surrendered the captives, and after stopping there a single day we put to sea. Already we began to see fish. Birds flew by, and all the other signs that land was near made their appearance. In a little while we saw men who were following a novel mode of sailing, being at once sailors and ships. Let me tell you how they did it, they lay on their backs on the water, hoisted their never mind watts which are sizable, spread sail on them, held the clues in their hands, and were off and away as soon as the wind struck them. Others came next who sat on corks and had a pair of dolphins hitched up, driving them and guiding them with reins, in moving ahead, the dolphins drew the corks along. They neither offered us harem nor ran away from us, but drove along fearlessly and peacefully, wondering at the shape of our boat and examining her from all sides. In the evening we touched at another island of no great size. It was inhabited by women, or so we thought, who spoke Greek. And they came up to us, welcomed and embraced us. They were got up just like courtesans and were all beautiful and young, with tunics that swept on the ground. The island was called Witchery, and the city Watertown.
Each of the women took one of us home with her and made him her guest. But I excused myself for a moment, I had misgivings, and on looking about rather carefully, saw many human bones and skulls lying there. To make an outcry, call my comrades together and ARM ourselves, did not seem best to me. But I fetched out my mallow and prayed to it earnestly that I might escape the ills that beset me. After a little while, as my hostess was waiting on me, I saw that her legs were not a woman's, but those of an ass. Then I drew my sword, caught and bound her, and questioned her about the whole thing. Against her will, she told me that they were women of the sea, called ass legs, and that they fed on the strangers that visited them. When we have made them drunk, said she, we go to bed with them and attack them in their sleep. On hearing this, I left her there tied up and myself went up to the house stop and cried out and called my comrades together. When they had come, I told them everything, showed them the bones, and led them into the woman who was tied up. But she immediately turned to water and disappeared. Nevertheless, I thrust my sword into the water as a test, and the water turned to blood. With all speed we went back to the ship and sailed away. When the light of day began to show, we saw land and judged it to be the world opposite the one which we inhabit. After doing homage and offering prayer, we took thought for the future. Some of us proposed just to land and then turn back again, others to leave the boat there. Go into the interior and see what the inhabitants were like. While we were debating this, a violent storm struck the boat, dashed it ashore and wrecked it, and we ourselves had much trouble in swimming out with our arms and anything else that we could catch up. Thus far, I have told you what happened to me until I reached the other world, first at sea, then during my voyage among the islands in the air, then in the whale, and after we left it, among the heroes and the dreams, and finally among the bullheads and the ass legs. What happened in the other world I shall tell you in the succeeding books.